of Opelousas and Atacapa, the most remarkable features in their geography are the prairies. Here you behold those vast herds of cattle which afford subsistence to the natives and to the inhabitants of the city of New Orleans. It is certainly one of the most agreeable views in nature to behold, from a point of elevation, thousands of horses and cows of all sizes scattered over the interminable mead, intermingled in wild confusion. When we estimate the extent of ground that must forever remain covered with grass, it is no extravagant declaration to call this one of the meadows of America. William Darby, 1803. This vast meadow of America, along with liberal grazing laws, allowed ranching to flourish in South Louisiana in the 18th and 19th centuries. The Atacapa and Opelousas trading posts were established as early as the 1730s. Early Europeans traveled from New Orleans with slaves to tend to these posts. On their return, it was the slave who was left behind to form business and personal relationships with the Native American cattle and horse traders in the region. Even before the Acadians arrive and transform the cattle industry, these slaves became the first vachers, or ranchers, in the territory. Before the Civil War, an estimated 70,000 cattle roamed au large, no fences confining them. They grazed all year round on the two and a half million acres of prairie grass. Even people without land found opportunity in the cattle business. <laughs> Horses were valued for their use in herding. Horsemen led the cattle to graze, moving with the seasons to follow the grass. Since all cattle roamed together, branding took the place of fences, separating one owner's cattle from his neighbors. Horsemanship became a way of life. Symbolically, horses have historically signified social status and wealth, while also marking man's capacity to control other animals, domesticating them for his needs. Conquerors are often memorialized in equestrian statues and paintings. For the plantation slave, an overseer on horseback represented power and dominance, the horse a means of escape. For many of Louisiana's black men, horses can still be associated with freedom and independence, work and respect. And on the vacheries of the prairies, everybody was on horseback. Oral histories, public records, and branding books identify the early ranchers in the Atacapa and Opelousas areas as Indians, women, and gens de couleur libre, or free people of color. Together, these people formed what is called the Creole population. This is the birth of some of America's first cowboys, French, Black, and Indian. Today, only a few ranches remain on Louisiana's vanishing prairie. Yet, despite the passing of time, many Creole descendants maintain small farmsteads and a love affair with their horses. My dad and usually about four black cowboys would take care of that whole ranch pretty much year round. When he needed cowboys to bring to the ranch to stay there, that was going to be their life from that moment forward. They would go to the Opelousas area and uh, bring the whole family back and load up all the belongings and uh, come back to get. 
They generally always came from down east. It originally started with probably the Caesar family that came from there. So maybe it was just hard economic times and they needed a job and it was just good cowboys. first home was the Gray Ranch in Gid, Louisiana, which is about four to five miles south of Benton. My dad, uh, whose real name was Herbert Henderson, known all his life as Pete, was a ranch foreman for more years than I can count. As a kid growing up, I remember when we got our first television set. So I watched uh, The Lone Ranger and Roy Rogers and all that. Cavendish, drop that gun. And of course, I was right there where there were people really living the cowboy life, although they weren't chasing rustlers and outlaws or carrying six guns. The cattle were rough. The horses were pretty rough. And I guess you'd say the men were rough too because they had to be to do some of the things they did. In the late fall, we would take them south to Johnson by the first day we'd swim the intercoastal. The next morning we'd saddle up and swim deep by and follow the roads to the uh, winter range, which was on the Gulf of Mexico. In the uh, spring, it would be just the opposite. Cowboy life is filled with difficulties. For marsh cowboys, the most dangerous undertaking was crossing water on their way to winter grazing. We would I load a bunch of men and a bunch of saddles and a little old wooden skiff, and we'd be overloaded, no life jackets. Half the crew couldn't swim. We all had on boots and spurs. By times, the mosquitoes were so bad, way back in the 30s and 40s, that they would actually find calves suffocated to death from the mosquitoes that would clog up their nostrils. We never kept cattle in the lower country down at the coast during hurricane season. That's why they were back at their ranch pastures during the summer months. And that's why we waited until late fall. In southwest Louisiana, there's a striking contrast in pasture land. As the cowboys worked their way south for winter grazing, the elevation drops, leading them to the marshes. Some of the marshes are easy to ride through. They're not as boggy. There's a, there's a certain type of grass growing in them. Others are what we call floating turf. They would be so boggy that it would take an extremely good marsh horse to cross it with a rider on his back. Uh, most of the time, you'd be down walking before you got 50 yards. Uh, I had a horse that I considered my marsh horse. A good marsh horse has to remain calm because when they start bogging, a lot of horses will panic. They'll start lunging and there's a chance of them jumping on top of you. The first black cowboys I remember were Lucian Bat Caesar and of course his son Joseph Bean Caesar and then Lucian's brother Victorian Vic Caesar and Vic had a son that rode at the ranch that we called Chuck Caesar I think his real name was John and then other than those there was Floyd Clifton who was known as Mano. Mano could rope really well when he was young he could ride any horse on the place. He was the one they primarily went to when they needed to break bad colts. He was one tough cowboy. He was uh, excellent with uh, any of the tools that the cowboys used. 
He could plant whips. He and the other black cowboys, they would take a horse mane and tail, and they would uh, thin it out, sort it by color, and they could make horsehair reins with it. They made a lot of their own equipment. They would repair tack, fix bridles, saddles, do all kinds of leather work. They were all real good with a rope. Unless it was some really wild cattle or a really huge herd, Vic Caesar was always the lead rider when we would bring the big herds of cattle. He would pretty much handle the front of the herd by himself. By most accounts, one of the best cowboys was Cyprien Césaire, a free man of color who became a prominent landowner ranching many head of cattle. A small settlement east of Swallow was named after him. L'Esprien Noir, meaning Black Cyprien's Cove. His descendants are still active horsemen today. I've been involved in horse ever since I was born for 72 years. I've been racing for at least 40 circuit races. So uh, I've been with horses all my life. Dad, daddy, and my daddy was two brothers. This over here in Metro Swallow, we started that about 14 years ago. That's the only track they got in Louisiana. Burger races. Uh, Hello, darling. I am the best cowboy. But now, as I grow older now, you know, I don't cowboy like I used to, you know, because I can't move as fast as I used to. Everything I do now, I do it slow, and it lasts longer. What about barely giving it hair. Don't look back, bro. You can hear they coming around. They're going around that. That's the sixth gear the second time, man. They're coming around. They're coming on home. Yeah, we were the cowboy. We, the, my parents and the grandfather, they, they were the original cowboy, you know. My grandfather, they'll set up them little Creole horse, they call them, you know. And he'll buck for half a day. Before he get on, he puts some tobacco in his pipe. And you stick it in his mouth, and he get on there. And while the horse was bucking, he'll reach in his pocket and get his match and light it. And he'll come back. When he come back with him, he might come back with another horse that he don't rope in the wood. Andrew Cesar is my uncle. I was a bully, and then he changed my life. He made a deal, and if I get better grades, that he was gonna give me a horse. So I got my stuff together, and I got my horse, and then I came back. I was student of the year. That was it. I just come show him all my grades, and then if he say if I drop him, he take the horse back, and I kept him up ever since. I see my papa doing it, and we all want to do it. We got a couple more that want to do it, but we just need the legs. Our legs need to be longer. My name is Kevin, and I live in Austin, and I'm uh, seven years old. And Uncle Andrew gave me a donkey, and he's finna give me a pony. My name is Andre Jacobs, and um, I'm 12. Uncle Andrew gave my um, my, my grandpa uh, a horse with a buggy. We trying to put a um for the for the um 4H. And now we uh he just gave me another horse for my roping career. His name is Woe. Uh, he's a black and white paint. And um we entered a 4H. Um both two of those horses did very good. Me and him, we won some awards for 4H. That's what's up. Our history is all African American. I'm part Indian. Well, my mom, and uh, I think oh, yes. they kind of Indian. No. It is hot. That Creole. Crazy. Well, that's all we got to say. Mm, I love Cajun. And I'm black. <laughs> I love Cajun. <laughs>
It's all crossbreed. I mean, you got the Indian, black, white, they all, they all messed up, you know. <laughs> That's why you see some yellow ones, some black ones, some white ones, and green-eyed ones, some whatever. Cesar, you see, Cesar is the original. Then they got some Caesar. That's not, that's not kin. Mm -hmm. But what the Caesar was, my grandfather, great-grandfather, he was the peacemaker. If a black woman was working for this doctor or a white man, you know, housekeeper, then she end up with a baby. And that baby come out white, you know. And she had a black husband. That black husband didn't want that white baby. So my grandfather would go with that, great, great grandpa. He would go get that baby and he'll bring it here to keep the peace in the family. If we dig deep enough, we all can. But we don't want to dig that far because <laughs> if we dig that far, nobody gonna get married. <laughs> Her name is Caledonia. What make your head so hard? Oh, oh, oh. Oh. Chip. Hot or rain, and if it rained, we drank beer and meat peanut. Get out of here, You gotta just imagine a horse pulling a bicycle. And what's gonna happen with that bicycle if you don't know where that horse is going? Yeah. That's what it is. It's that light. We call it a bike. And it's just like a bicycle. I guess for uh, riding the Salgis, the first thing you got to learn the horse because each horse pulls a little different. You got to have horse sense. You got to be horse inclined. Thing, having the feel, the driver and the horse becoming one. To be able to sit in that buggy, because your mind, that tail is in your face. That's all your mind is just focusing on that horse. Because if he stumble, you got to be able to lift him to, so he can stay on his feet. If you drop the line, then we, we didn't have some bad falls already. You know? I mean, you gonna fly once that shaft hit the ground. Barely, barely, and you really feel that straight. Here they going around that boat coach. And here they coming around. And it's Billy, Blue Billy, right here straight. And here they coming around. And they coming around that boat coach. And it's Billy, 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 and put a boy. Billy and put a boy. And Billy giving it hell. Don't look back. Here they coming around. They going around that. I've the the been with horses most of my life. And still breaking horses right now. You know, riding horses and then we break them to the bug. You know, we parade on wagons and you know we gotta train mules and we do all that around here. I'm Rayfield Laverne from Basia. Big frail ride fan. Find a wood, you're in the woods. It's a nice ride, you can get out, and you see all your family, but everybody's family at Piney Wood, I don't care. You can be white, black, Mexican, and it's, everybody get along at Piney Wood. You know? Piney Wood is a trail ride, but it's a festival. The Piney Woods Trail Ride is just one of many annual Creole trail rides found on South Louisiana's landscape on just about any given weekend. Other trail rides include the 20-year-old Big Eight and the new New Step Riders, both shown here. 
Trail rides are the largest gatherings of Le Monde Creole, the Creole community. I speak better at Creole than I do at English. <laughs> so we have a deep culture, a real deep culture. I'm a resident of Parks, Louisiana, and a member of the Big A Trail Riders Association. And the whole purpose of the Trail Rod Organization is to preserve the black cowboy culture. Uh, I guess a cowboy is anyone who depends upon the equine uh, for, uh, for a purpose. I guess you'd call us cowboys, urban cowboys. Uh, we depend upon them for relaxation, stress relief. Trail riding over the 20 years has changed a whole lot. As you can see, trail riding has turned out to uh, more of an urban. You know, the, the old Western culture is still there in our hearts, but in certain areas it's just not possible. So we try to make the best of it. It's a family activity. Uh, one of those activities that the family travels together, uh, you get a chance to spend a lot of quality time with the family, on horses, 